Okay, I'm going to welcome you all here today to a, a continuation in our Distinguished Speakers series. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of inviting um, Bill Marler here to be our speaker. This is a, this is a, um, one, of this, the, one of the inclusion in the series that is today sponsored by the Department of Biology and the School of Law uh, at UofL. And some of you in the audience, um, so I'll, uh, full disclosure, Bill Marler is a litigation uh, attorney. And some of you may be asking, why would the biology department invite an attorney to a distinguished speaker's series to present? And so I was reading an article in the New Yorker called A Bug in the System. And the article pretty much uh, profiles uh, Bill Marler and his work. And, you know, after reading that article, you know, it just scared the bejeebies out of me. <laughs> and, and I said, we've got to get this guy to come here and talk. And the reason is that um, Bill is really at the inter interface between uh, the law and biology, specifically microbiology and infectious disease. And I thought he is exactly the kind of person that needs to come here and talk and, and tell you about the kinds of stuff that he's seen in litigation, but in the area of food safety. And um, I'm sure he'll make you very wary of the food that you eat. Um, Bill is a uh, um, Seattle boy, born and bred, um, and he got his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, Washington State, so he had to leave Seattle for a little bit, and then went back to Seattle, uh, Seattle University to get his law degree. And uh, I know that there are some of you that are old enough in the room, probably most of you that are old enough, but you may not remember. Anybody heard of Jack in the Box? Yeah? Uh, so in 1993, Jack in the Box had an outbreak of um, their food being contaminated with toxigenic E. coli. Bill Marler, uh, today's guest, was the uh, attorney in that uh, class action lawsuit that went after them uh, for uh, what they had done um, and the kinds of mistakes that they made and how that affected the people that got sick from their food. Um, so he's been involved in food, litigation, food safety litigation for uh, quite a while and has been involved in, I'd say, all the prominent class action lawsuits against a variety of companies, including uh, Walmart, Cargill, ConAgra, um, KF KFC? No, Taco Bell. Okay. Okay. No, yeah, 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 okay, anyway, a, bu a, a bunch. He's been in, involved in a bunch, and over the years, uh, in addition to being profiled in uh, New York, he's been profiled in a number of other places. He's got a, um, a blog that he, uh, that he maintains regularly, writes articles, and he's received a number of awards. I'm just going to give you a, a sampling. So um, he got the 2010 NSF Food Safety Leadership Award for Innovation and Education. Uh, in 2009 until present, he's been in the Best Lawyers in America. Um, he also received the Public Justice Award from Washington State Trial Lawyers, Lawyers Association. And uh, from 1998 to the present, uh, he has been a super lawyer uh, among Washington State attorneys. And today he's going to tell you about the work that he does. It's very important work. And if it doesn't scare you, I don't know, you know, you guys are ready for Halloween because nothing will scare you. <laughs> and so without further ado, uh, Bill Marler. Thanks. Are we on? Thanks a lot. Well, a good turnout here. Isn't this cool to be in a planetarium? So I think I have some memory of the 70s going to a planetarium and watching a laser show. Uh, I'm not sure I remember the entire event, but I guess that goes with, uh, in the state of Washington, uh, we have more legal drugs than you guys probably have stills here in uh, Kentucky. Um, so it, the guy said I can't look up uh, because eventually my neck will snap back, but it's, it's pretty cool. Are you guys all comfortable? All right. So um, uh, thanks for the introduction, and I, I have a tendency to wander around, um, and, uh, but I have been doing this uh, for somewhat of a long time. Uh, I know I don't look any different uh, today than I did. Uh, uh, that was my campaign poster uh, in 1977 when I ran for the uh, Pullman City Council at age 19. Uh, I was, uh, for about a year, I was the youngest, I just had turned 
19, I was the youngest elected person in the United States. Uh, we had just uh, gotten the right to vote a few years earlier, so uh, for all of you who are uh, millennials, uh, you know, make sure you vote, make sure you register to vote, because uh, we're gonna have an important election coming up. Um, food production, let me, before I start, um, part of the slides that I'm gonna talk about and part of my talk is a little bit about what I talk to businesses about, which is why it's a bad idea to poison your customers. Um, but the fact is that you know food production is a risky business. Um, the uh, you know competitive markets. Um, you know there are a lot of people vying for your food dollar, um, and it's the relatively low margin. Uh, stockholder pressures. Th this is true not only in food companies, but in, in, in many of our companies that are publicly held. Uh, there is always pressure to make profits quickly. And as you can imagine, sometimes, especially in food safety, it's difficult to specifically say, well, you know, if we spend this money today, uh, for sure, Marler's not going to be able to sue you tomorrow. And that's sometimes very difficult to quantify. And, and when you're asking a company to invest money that might drop its stock price, it's kind of difficult. Um, and really, you know, that is the, the lack of a reward. Um, there are a lot of companies that spend a lot of money on food safety and never have a problem. And there are companies who spend no money on food safety and don't have a problem. Um, now clearly, that has a lot to do with, uh, sometimes it's hard to catch companies, and we'll talk a little bit about how difficult it is from the microbiological and viral point of view. Sometimes it's difficult to catch companies who poison their customers. But one of the things I think that drives a lot of the decisions about food safety, especially in big companies, is brand awareness risk. That um, they don't want to be known as the place that poisoned and sickened a bunch of kids. But that is, you know, companies that you know have names in the news all the time. It's one of my I stole that slide uh, from someone simply because one of, the, one of the things that uh, is, is true nowadays uh, that I think was different when I first started, um, you know, it really is a global food economy. Um, uh, I think sometimes when outbreaks happen, uh, people try to sit blame it on an imported food product. And 20 years ago when I first started doing this, very few of the outbreaks I was involved in were linked to imported food products. I used to say that you know, U.S. companies do a marvelous job of poisoning us, and it's not really the imports. But that has really changed. Uh, the number of outbreaks that are linked to imported foods is increasing. And that is because our, you know, food footprint, uh, the, the long supply chain is getting longer. And we're importing foods from all over the world. Uh, and, and frankly, we're exporting foods all over the world. So the risks of contamination uh, as you lengthen that supply chain, become more and more risky and more and more complex. So, any lawyers in the room? Nobody's going to admit it? That's great. Well, if there's no lawyers in the room, uh, I can get by with uh, sort of truncating this pretty quickly. But these are the things that I paid attention to when I was in law school. There's some pretty simple stuff. Um, there's three concepts, strict liability, negligence, and punitive damages, uh, or criminal liability as well. Uh, strict liability in the law asks some really basic questions. Are you a manufacturer? Uh, was the product unsafe, and did the product cause injury? I was asked the other day by a reporter, there's a Shigella outbreak in San Francisco area, San Jose, and a reporter was asking me, well, you know, you know, how can you sue this restaurant? Um, and I said, well, you know, they're making a defective product. I, and they, they're, they're selling tacos. I'm like, yeah, it's a defective taco. They put, you know, the, this together and this together and this together. And 
within that taco is human feces. And I would argue that having human feces in a taco makes it a defective product. It's sort of like you know, the uh, GM and their car ignitions. You know, GM puts a car together, tires, wheels, you know, engines, a defective ignition, and it bursts into flame and kills somebody. It's pretty easy for us to look at that and go, well, that was a defective ignition switch. It was a defective product, and therefore, they're strictly liable because you can't sell a product with a defect. Human feces, ignition switch, sort of the same thing in product liability, in strict liability. Negligence is a little different, and it's something I think we're more familiar with. It's sort of the idea of, you know, you're texting while driving and you run into the back of somebody. That's negligent. That's also stupid. But stupid and negligence kind of go hand in hand. In a food context, um, I give you a good example. In the Odwalla E. coli outbreak in 1996, Odwalla was a manufacturer of apple juice, and we'll talk a little bit more about it deeper into the slides. But they manufactured, they, they ground apples, they put it in these jars, and, uh, uh, and shipped them across the Western United States. It was an unpasteurized product. And the unpasteurized product was sold at Starbucks as a kid's apple juice. And they, Starbucks would open up the jar and pour it into a cup and sell it for five bucks. And there was an E. coli outbreak. A, a child died. About 15 people developed hemolytic uremic syndrome or acute kidney failure. And one of the questions is, do I sue Starbucks? Um, and, that, and in 1996, I didn't think Starbucks was negligent for selling unpasteurized juice to a child. I'd look at that differently today. You know, I think it would be negligent for a company like Starbucks to sell juice to a five-year-old today. So that's one of the things about negligence. It, it can kind of change over time based on science, based on change. Um, Punitive damages, or that's the idea of punishing somebody. The, the strict liability and negligence allows you to be compensated for medical expenses and wage loss. Punitive damages punishes somebody. There are very few times in a foodborne illness case where punitive damages are awarded. But one of the things that we've seen more recently, and I'll talk more about it later, is the idea of criminal liability. And, and even in the news recently, we've heard about people going to jail for selling contaminated food products. Um, remember, under strict liability, manufacturer is the, is the key definition. And if you look at this definition of manufacturer, and those are like giant words. First of all, you realize as you read it, uh, a scientist didn't write that, a lawyer did. Because one of the questions you have to ask yourself is like, who the hell's not a manufacturer? And that's one of the, the beauties of, of, uh, of strict liability is, is that if you do anything to that product, you're likely a manufacturer. And if you do anything to that product, and that product has a pathogen in it that sickens or kills your kid, you're strictly liable. This is usually when somebody in the audience uh, raises their hand and says, well, that's not very fair, Bill. You know, we could try really hard and we can do everything right and you still can sue us? I'm just like, well, yeah, if you try really hard and you do everything right and you still have pathogens, human feces in your food, there's clearly something went wrong. So yes, I still can sue you. So, the best defense is prevention. If you prevent a pathogen from being in your food product, if you prevent your food product from being defective, you don't ever have the problem. Um, because it doesn't matter if you took all precautions. And if you manufacture a product that makes someone sick, it's not whether you're gonna pay, it's how much you're gonna pay. And wishful thinking doesn't help. Um, that sign, E. coli, please go away, actually was on a, a school board uh, or school uh, sign out in front of a high school in Walkerton, Ontario, that had an E. coli outbreak in their water supply. So, 
for those scientists that are here, and I understand most of you are, um, I'm going to kind of quickly go through this. This is where most of the science part of what I do comes into play. And it also, I think, is, is important to understand sometimes how difficult foodborne illness outbreaks are to figure out. Um, I always use the sort of the, the symbol of like a funnel. I mean, there's all of us at the top of a funnel. There's people that eat food further down the funnel. There are people that get sick. And you keep working your way down because it's, it is a very circuitous thing. You know, if, if you get sick, you know, are you sick enough to go to the doctor? If you go to the doctor, is the doctor going to do a stool or blood culture that might tell what organism it is that's making you sick? Once the specimen is collected and the organism identified, one of the things that, is, that we see today where we didn't see 20 years ago is bugs like Salmonella and E. coli, Listeria, Campylobacter, Shigella are all reportable bacterial diseases that if a lab, if a hospital finds it, um, they're supposed to contact the health department. But health departments, depending upon what state you're in, have more or less interest in investigating these things. They're not, you know, they're not mandated to do it. And you might have a state that's very interested in diarrhea, like Minnesota, which has a, a group of graduate students in public health. They call themselves Team Diarrhea. And they actually spend a lot of time reaching out to ERs and reaching out to pediatricians going, hey, do you got any diarrhea today? You know, has anybody got bloody diarrhea? And so they're, they're trying to figure out and try to catch cases early. There are a lot of states that have more interest in whatever and aren't interested in that. So they're sometimes weeks, if not months, if or ever connected up with outbreaks. I always think it's kind of interesting when you look at a, especially a, a nationwide outbreak where you've got salmonella hundreds and hundreds of people with salmonella in every state but two. And do you really think that the cucumbers or the peanut butter wasn't sold in that state and that people didn't get sick? They're just not being counted for whatever reason. So in many respects, the securitous route of getting a foodborne illness connected up to a product can be very difficult because not every health department is playing in the same game. But once, you know, if a public health lab finds it, then there's an epidemiological investigation. And again, if it's a multi-state outbreak, it can, it can be completely dependent on how important that health department thinks the investigation really should be. But in a perfect world, once an epidemiological investigation happens, and they can identify a likely food product, then they're linking it back to a particular food item, which then will prompt the recall uh, and eventually may well prompt a lawsuit. Um, one of the things that um, I do as a lawyer is interface a lot with public health, and, and I sort of think about them as sort of my investigatory partners. Um, this is uh, an actual document from a, an outbreak I was involved in. There was a, a, a salmonella outbreak at a fancy golf and country club up in upstate New York. And hundreds of people were sickened over about a three or four week period of time who went to weddings, uh, bar mitzvahs, uh, you know, christenings. And um, I wound up representing about 100 of the people. And I got all their health department documents and, and their medical records. And I went to meet with the lawyer and the insurance company for the, and they said, look, Bill, we're not going to pay you on any of these claims. And I said, well, that's fine. You know, you know, it's your choice. And I said, but you want to tell me why? And they said, well, because every one of your clients is being investigated as a criminal. And I'm like, really? Why? And they said, yes, look here. It says suspected, FBI. So. Anyway, I, I got up and I said, thank you very much, and I'll see you guys in court. And for those who are chuckling, understanding that suspected FBI was suspected foodborne illness. 
Um, admittedly, much of the work that I use to prosecute my cases are, is handed to me by public health. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to get, but you know, we, we look at all of the data, both from laboratory investigators, epidemiological investigators, and environmental investigators, investigations. All of that stuff comes into play at various points in a legal case. Um, sometimes, you know, you don't have uh, environmental samples of product. Most of the time, uh, you know, there isn't food left over to test to definitively say that, oh, yes, it was that taco that had the human feces in it because guess what? People ate the evidence. That's how they got sick. So, you know, sometimes in these outbreaks where there's not environmental samples, there's not something to um, connect up the dots, uh, you have to go with good lab practices and good epidemiological, uh, you know, what's the common source of everyone's illness? Were they all in the same place? What, what are the things that connect these people together? What's the control? You know, are there other people who did similar things except they didn't eat or drink or were somewhere where the same people who ate something got sick? All of these things come into play. Incubation period. You know, I'm always, I was talking to, um, uh, I was talking to a reporter from Indiana, uh, from Indianapolis yesterday about uh, Matt Hasselbeck, the, the uh, apparently he's, uh, well he used to be the Seattle Seahawks quarterback. Uh, he's now like a really old dude. He's like 40 years old and he's like, and I, I think to myself, I was like, really? That's an old guy, but he, apparently in football years, that's, you are an old guy. Uh, apparently the last two games he was uh, involved in, he had a foodborne illness. And he, you know, with IVs and antibiotics, he gutted it out and won two games. Uh, and, the, and, and Matt told somebody that it was the chicken burrito he ate. And so the reporter was like, well, you know, you know, Tell me, you know, it had to be the chicken burrito. I'm like, well, not really. I mean, what kind of bacteria did Matt have? Well, I don't know. I said, was it salmonella, Campylobacter, Shigella? I said, each one of these bacteria have slightly, sometimes overlapping incubation periods. So it's never the last thing that you ate most of the time. It's something you ate sometimes days, if not weeks. Listeria has an incubation period of three to 60 days. You know, I can't remember what I ate last night. I do remember I had a really nice margarita, but I don't remember necessarily what I ate. I can't tell you what I ate 60 days ago. Can you? So that also becomes really important when, you know, you're trying to figure out the cause of an outbreak. And I'm telling all of this not because I'm trying to explain how difficult my job is, but it's how, in some respects, how fortuitous outbreak, figuring out outbreaks actually really is, and how important science, and how important good lab results, and how important good epidemiology really is. Uh, genetic fingerprinting has become uh, you know, really important. In uh, most outbreaks, uh, you can still use good epidemiological evidence as, and still need it for genetic fingerprinting. But you know, we're, we're now getting into genomic sequencing, which is really interesting because some of the recent recalls and outbreaks that the CDC have been reported are ones that go back five or six years. They're in many respects, they're getting these genomic sequencing down where they can actually sort of reach back into the, in a sense, reach into the grave and go, hey, you know, those three people died of eating a particular product that was, and they died five years ago. And you're figuring it out now because they're now doing genomic sequencing on their uh, isolates and they can look back. It'll be interesting because in a court setting, I can't just walk into a court and say, well, I've got PFG matches, genetic matches, and therefore I win you still have to show epidemiological evidence. You have to show that the person ate the product. Genomic sequencing is a little different, and it may, there might be somebody here who could argue with me, but 
but, but genomic sequencing is getting it down to like the particular entity, the particular person. Um, and I think that's gonna be very interesting and we haven't had a case yet where genomic sequencing was either gonna be allowed or not allowed and whether or not the court was, is still gonna allow or have, require um, in, uh, epidemiological uh, investigations as well. Um, I've got to get some new slides, and I've got lots of them, but these are sort of one of the things lawyers do is collect things over time, and these are some of my favorite documents. So I want to take you back a little bit in time. So 1992, um, in the state of Washington, uh, the Department of Health made some decisions based on the fact that people in public health were aware of a, this emerging pathogen of E. coli 0157H7. There had been an outbreak uh, at, an old, at an old folks home in Walla Walla, and it was linked to E. coli 0157 linked to uh, tacos, to hamburger uh, in tacos. So what public health did, in conjunction with uh, the, the Department of Agriculture, they made 0157 a reportable illness. So if a lab found it, they had to report it to public health. And secondly, they increased the cook times in hamburger from 140, which was the national food code, to 155. Only state in the country to do that. So two things that are important, uh, reportable illness and 155, okay? Meet Brianne Kiner. Pretty much your typical nine-year-old third grader. She likes to ride bikes, read books, school and hang out with friends and family but this is Brianne Kiner as she was before E. coli ravaged her young body and mind before something as seemingly harmless as a hamburger nearly took her life Wednesday January 13 1993 nine-year-old Brianne Kiner is rushed to Children's Hospital in Seattle she'd been suffering with diarrhea and stomach pains for three days at first, her mother, Suzanne, thought it was the flu, but while helping Brianne with a urine specimen at the doctor's office, Mrs. Kiner realized something was terribly wrong. When I brought the cup up from behind her, it was blood had filled it and flowed over my hand. Brianne was later admitted to Children's Hospital's intensive care unit. Tests revealed she had been infected with the deadly E. coli bacteria after eating an undercooked hamburger at a Redmond Jack in the Box restaurant. Brianne's body was so bloated you could barely recognize her. Blood seeped from every orifice. Doctors were pouring bag after bag of blood into Brianne's body, but the E. coli bacteria was unrelenting. Within a week, Brianne slipped into a coma. Brianne's father, Rex, was living on faith. There was just times of almost extreme sadness and then just oh, it's giving up and just saying, God, she's yours. After five weeks in a coma, after coming so close to pulling the plug, their daughter Brianne was suddenly, inexplicably back. Um, I still had the mask on my mouth for breathing. I said, I love you, Mommy, and um, she knew I came back for her, and I love her. But Brianne knew in order to leave the hospital, she had to be able to walk. It took hours of intensive daily therapy to reach her goal. A month and a half after she came out of the coma, Brianne finally took her first steps. I took little baby steps when I first started and when I walk again. I kind of like told myself, but I don't want to get out of this place. You have to go through this. I tell mom and dad I want to go home. I want to be with my friends. But I knew I had to stay there until the time was right. Brianne has continuing nightmares, dreams of cobras with fangs, a big black hole. E. coli has left Brianne with brain damage and has left its mark in other ways. She can't have children. How will she deal with that? She's writing medical history. There's nobody with this disease who's been as sick as she is, or was, and lived. 
As for Brienne, she plods along with her daily ritual to combat diabetes and asthma brought on by E. coli. And there are challenges ahead that Brienne doesn't even know about yet, but her parents know all too well. So remember, 1992, 0157's now a reportable illness in the state of Washington, and the rule is now 155 degrees internal temperature. Um, one of the things that the State uh, Department of Health did was reach out to restaurants all over the state, and then also for restaurants that had corporate headquarters outside the state, reach out to those corporate headquarters, regardless of what they were, to explain the new cooking temps. Um, and this is a truism uh, in, in my, my line of work. There has never been a foodborne illness outbreak that I've been involved in that could not have been prevented. Uh, in, a, in many respects, shit just doesn't happen. Usually what happens is there's a series of errors or a series of things that happen that people ignore, that people eventually, uh, and then it comes back to bite them. And here's a good instance. So remember, 1992, so we're, this, is, this is a document from June of 1992. Uh, in each jack-in-the-box, they had a fax machine, really high tech for 1992. And you could fax things directly to corporate headquarters, and they had this document called In the Suggestion Box. And Wendy Conchinella, who was a shift leader at a Bellingham, Washington jack-in-the-box, sent this to corporate headquarters. I think regular patties should cook longer. They don't get done and we have customer complaints. Describe the benefit. If we change this, we'll be making our burgers done and edible. June 1992, seven months before the outbreak. They write back to Wendy. Wendy, we'd like to acknowledge the time and effort you've taken to contribute to the success of Jack in the Box by enclosing this pen highlighter. Each person submitting a suggestion is eligible to receive a gift, one gift per quarter, off with their first suggestion. Uh, July 1992. I always thought they should have made her a vice president. Um, what was interesting is after the litigation happened, um, I got millions of pages of documents. And some of the documents were uh, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper with these lines drawn in them, cross hatches, kind of like a weird tic-tac-toe. And inside there were little circles. And, and inside the circles were numbers. 132, 145, 155, different numbers. And at first I was like, what in the heck is this? And then it dawned on me. It's little, it's little uh, uh, grills with little hamburgers and temperatures. So what they were trying to do is in corporate headquarters, we're trying to see if they could make their burgers done and edible. So they did that work and they wrote back to Wendy and CC'd everybody in the corporation, every restaurateur, and said, we uh, researched your suggestion and determined that with the variability of our grill temps, 350 to 400, the two minute cook time is appropriate. If patties are cooked longer than two minutes, they tend to become tough. Interesting fact, if, if they were new, temp, new grills, they were higher temp, and the two minute cook time got things to 155. The old grills cook things cooler. So at two minute cooks time, they didn't get to 155 and usually were in the 140s. Guess where all the old grills were? State of Washington and San Diego, California, where Jack in the Box's corporate headquarters were. Guess how quickly after the outbreak, they went from two minutes to two minutes and 10 seconds on their cook time because that extra 10 seconds, even on the old grills, was sufficient to get the hamburgers to 155. 10 seconds. 10 seconds, and I wouldn't be standing here today. 10 seconds. Another interesting fact about the Jack in the Box case most people don't know is, is that actually it started not in Seattle in 1993, but actually started in San Diego in November of 1992, where there was a cluster of about 40 people who got sick in the San Diego area, including one child who died. Um, and the state of California, E. coli 0157 was not a reportable disease. Had 0157 been a reportable disease, 
public health wouldn't have been flying blind, likely would have figured out that that outbreak was going on, and that meat never would have gotten shipped to the state of Washington, where it was used and people started getting sick in mid-January of 1993. A reportable disease, if that was that case in California, again, I wouldn't be standing here today. I really thought that after the Jack in the Box case sort of wound down in 1995, 1996, that I'd go back to chasing whatever ambulance came by. And, um, and the Odwalla case landed in my lap. The Odwalla, as maybe some of you may or may not know, was a, a small company that uh, grew really quickly, was very popular on the West Coast. Uh, they, their, their sort of thing was unpasteurized juice. You know, they sold it at Grateful Dead concerts, and, you know, and, uh, it was quite popular, uh, you know, that uh, unpasteurized juice is better for you. And, has more microbes in it. Well, yeah, it has a lot of microbes in it, including ones that'll kill you. Um, they then tried to sell their juice to the US Army, uh, not as a biological weapon, but as uh, a product that would be sold on you know, PXs around the country. Now, this outbreak happened in November of 1996. In June, July of 1996, the U.S. Army came out to the Odwalla uh, production facility and did a, uh, a very thorough analysis. And one of the letters they wrote was this one. Again, August 1996, before the outbreak. We reviewed the deficiencies noted in the report, which our inspector discussed with you at the time of the inspection. As a result, we determined that your plant sanitation program does not adequately assure product wholesomeness for military consumers. This lack of assurance prevents approval of your establishment as a source of supply for the armed forces at this time. You would think that a company that was being told you can't, that the army won't buy your juice, would maybe think about whether or not they should sell it to pregnant women and little kids. But no, no, no. They wanted to keep selling their product. The outbreak happened. Show of hands, how many people think that Odwalla gave me that document? You guys are paying attention. No, they didn't. One day I came into the office and there was a message on my uh, message machine. Mr. Marler, make sure you get the US Army documents regarding Odwalla. Click. <laughs> so I did a FOIA request on the US Army and got a handful of documents, uh, including their test results. I then spent about two or three months sort of setting up Odwalla and their lawyers uh, about you know, whether or not they gave me these documents, which they didn't. Um, I then went to court and asked the judge to uh, not only amend my complaint to add punitive damages, but also if the court would be kind enough to seize their hard drives from corporate headquarters and have a forensic person scrub them because I was convinced that they had deleted documents. And the court said yes to both. So I got to see all the emails and all the documents, uh, or most of them. But one of my favorite ones was this one. And, and what's important is the date. It's September 1996. So now we're a couple of months before this out, the outbreak even happened. And this is the great line. It says, it's not the vendor's criteria I'm concerned about. It's on Wallace. Why are we doing it? Why now? What do we want to prove? If the data is bad, what do we do about it? Once you create a body of data, it's subpoenable. No shit. You should look at this as though the Fresno Bee, which is their local paper, has looked into the results and asked a lot of questions. This should be done in advance so you know what you're in for if you don't like the data. I'm not saying no. I'm just saying you want everyone in Danuba, which is corporate headquarters, on board. So, and what they were talking about is end product microtesting. Put it in the context that the US Army a month earlier said, we're not going to buy your juice because it's got too much crappy stuff in it. We're not going to buy it. So they start, well, you know, maybe we should do in product testing, make sure we, it's safe. How many people think they did in product testing? Of course not. They didn't want to create a body of data that was subpoenable. Um, they rather run the risk that, you know, 100 people are going to get sick and a child is going to die. 
not my favorite juice product. Um, but things aren't completely bad. Um, you know, this is the uh, CDC's uh, happy face, uh, sad face report uh, about uh, increases and decreases in foodborne pathogens. Um, I told a group of students this morning, some, some of you I recognized this morning, that you know, from 1993, the Jack Box case, to about 2003, about 90% of my law firm's revenue was E. coli cases linked to hamburger. Today, that's nearly zero. I have the few E. coli cases I have linked to hamburger are E. coli cases linked to uh, grass-fed local organic meat that the the chefs think you can cook to you know rare because magically grass-fed organic local beef somehow magically doesn't have pathogens in it because Michael Pollan said that in Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is things have improved, um, especially in the meat side, um, but things have you know, not improved the sad faces uh, in certain other things. I want to talk really quickly about a horrible outbreak. Uh, and some of you, a little bit more sort of up to date, was the uh, listeria outbreak linked to cantaloupes uh, that sickened 147 people and killed 33 people in the United States. Um, it was a somewhat nationwide outbreak, as you can tell from the map. But it was the largest foodborne death toll in some 75 to 100 years in the US. Uh, it's just hard to sort of wrap your head around the fact that people are dying from eating cantaloupe in the US in 2011. But in fact, they were. Um, and uh, many of the people had just incredible stories. Um, I had one gentleman who was a 92-year-old, very healthy, golfed a couple times a week, was a World War II uh, decorated uh, veteran, uh, two Purple Hearts, uh, and he dies from eating a cantaloupe. It just, you know, uh, you know, yes, the elderly are more vulnerable, the young are more vulnerable, pregnant women are more vulnerable, people with immune compromise are more vulnerable, but you, you shouldn't die in the United States in 2011 from eating a cantaloupe. What was interesting about this outbreak is the cause. Um, a fourth generation cantaloupe growing and processing uh, family. Um, the father uh, had died a few years earlier of uh, cancer. The sons were convinced, and possibly, the sons were convinced that it was all the pesticides and herbicides that they had sprayed on the cantaloupe uh, to make them grow that was the cause. And so they were in the process of trying to go organic and, and sort of move in that direction. And in 2010, they had been um, inspected, uh, required inspection by um, one of the big box stores, uh, a required audit, which they passed you know, quite well. But one of the things the auditor said to them is said, you know, you have this cold bath where the cantaloupes come up, drop into a cold water that's chlorinated. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical control point for you, but it's also a place where you have to pay attention to the chlorine level. And if you don't pay attention to the chlorine level, um, you know, you could be just creating, you know, a bath of pathogens. So it's probably, why don't you think about getting rid of that cold bath of chlorine and go to something else. And so what the two brothers did is they wanted to get rid of that chlorine, which they sort of equated to pesticides and herbicides. And they bought a potato washing machine that they jury rigged, had brushes on it, they jury rigged it into a cantaloupe washing machine and they got rid of the chlorine. They got rid of the chlorine bath, they got rid of the chlorine and we're just using city tap water. Do you wanna think about how this outbreak happened? What was different about 2011 than the other years before? It was the lack of that cold bath of chlorine.
how do you get past this? Um, this was an outbreak that shouldn't have occurred for that reason. But it also, I think, also underscores the power that especially big retailers have over the supply chain. Um, they push so much responsibility up the supply chain. And you can see sort of the reason. Because you know, you're a grocery store receiving stuff. There's kind of very little you can do to protect your consumer for especially fresh products like, like a cantaloupe because it's coming into your store and if it's contaminated, it's contaminated. But one of the things that big retailers have done is they push legal responsibility upstream and then they feel like they can wash their hands of it. The problem is, as you push responsibility upstream, you, you push responsibility onto entities that have the least profits in which to fix problems. And what you see is people cutting corners because they have to balance between food safety and making a profit. Sometimes they cut out some of the food safety things and the product comes to the retailer in a problematic format and we have an outbreak. So when we talk nowadays about food safety from farm to fork, um, what big box retailers are trying to do is it's food safety from farm, but not us, directly to the fork. And that's something that in this litigation, um, the big box stores had to deal with because Jensen Farms went bankrupt, the middlemen went bankrupt, and we came knocking on Kroger and Walmart's doors uh, successfully. Another thing about this case that really became precedential is, is that the auditor, which had given the advice about the, the, the washing and the cold bath, and had also uh, audited the company both in 2010 and 2011, gave uh, Jensen Farms a superior rating like a lot of auditors do, uh, and the Jensen Farms paid about $2,500 for that audit, which was required by Walmart and Kroger. And Walmart and Kroger, frankly, just wanted the piece of paper that said that they had passed. And what was interesting is when um, we sued Primus, they said, we're not responsible for this outbreak. You know, We're not responsible for the audit that we performed. And the, the victims can't sue us because they're not a third party beneficiary of our audit. And in all the cases that we dealt with across the United States, the courts found differently. And so one of the things that came out of this case now is, is that audit companies are now potentially liable to the consumers for a bad audit. And I really think in the long run that's gonna change the audit industry for the better. Um, we're getting into the sort of the, the criminal punitive side of the equation. And I like my slide. Um, this is, uh, you know, for those, I think most of you, uh, or many of you might uh, recall, just in the last uh, bit of time, uh, Stuart Parnell, uh, the gentleman in the red tie, is now spending 28 years in jail. And Sam Lightsey, even though he testified against Stewart, uh, is going to be spending six years in jail. Um, the, uh, oops, can, I back, can you back that one up? Um, this, this outbreak, 700 people sick and nine dead. Um, and the cause of the outbreak was salmonella. Um, and what these guys were charged with uh, were multiple, multiple felony counts for knowingly shipping contaminated product across state lines. What happened in this instance is that uh, Kellogg and others who were buying their peanut products to put into snack crackers and ice cream and all sorts of things would require them to do uh, what's called a certificate of analysis. So they did this test and they would send along with that lot that it's free of salmonella. What happened is they would test, they'd find actually a presumptive positive for salmonella. They would ship a sample to another lab, get a negative, and then they'd use that negative certificate of analysis and ship the lot. Sometimes when they were having, when both, when both places had um, 
positive tests, they would just forge a negative certificate analysis and send it out anyway. So they were charged, uh, Stewart was charged with 74 felony counts. Uh, he was convicted, 76 felony counts. He was convicted of 74. He was facing 803 years in jail. Uh, he's uh, only getting 28, but at age 64, the chances of him ever getting out of jail before he's dead is quite low. This, this prosecution has sent shockwaves through the food industry that you know, corporate, you know, corporate America is, at least on the food side of the equation, is paying attention. Um, but what's interesting is under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, you don't necessarily need to have intent in order to be prosecuted for a crime. Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, you can be charged with a misdemeanor, but a misdemeanor can still put you in jail for up to a year and a $250,000 fine per charge if you ship contaminated product across state lines, whether you know it or not. Remember my concept of strict liability where all that I need to prove is that the pathogen was in the product? FDA has that same rule, only they can put you in jail for a year and charge you $250,000 per charge. The Jensen brothers, our cantaloupe friends, were charged with five counts, were facing five years in jail each, and a $250,000 fine per charge. They ultimately were given five years of probation, uh, and I bankrupted them and their farm, um, but they could have faced time in jail. Um, there has been a, a couple of more recent uh, criminal prosecutions, ConAgra, uh, Wright County Egg, where the Wright County Egg CEO is going to spend three years, or excuse me, three months in jail. Uh, that's being appealed, but he had to pay an $11 million fine, or excuse me, $7 million fine, and ConAgra had to pay nearly a $12 million fine. FDA, Office of Criminal Investigation, US, U.S. attorneys are becoming more aggressive. But, um, you know, what about other outbreaks? This was one that happened just last Christmas that's been in the news recently uh, as well. Um, you know, 35 people sick, uh, you know, deaths, no prosecution. Why is this different than Jensen Farms? Those are some public policy questions that are going to have to be, you know, answered, you know, as we move forward. Are we going to criminalize our food system as sort of the means to deal with food safety problems because we as taxpayers don't want to spend the money to get FDA inspectors in plants? Because that's really what this is about. Uh, it's the federal government using the criminal law as a way of trying to make our food supply safer uh, without having to spend the money to do that. Um, you know, ultimately, ultimately, it's all about identifying hazards. It's ultimately about, you know, having a culture in, in a company that allows you to pay attention to things like, oh, we got a new temperature of 155. Oh, you know, the Army won't buy our juice. Maybe we should do something differently. Having a culture that allows the people in your company to say something. And like, hey, maybe we need to do end product testing, and we really should, and if you don't do it, I'm going to resign. Or we got to do you know, more than a two-minute cook time because you know, there's been outbreaks of 0157, and if we don't, we're going to poison a bunch of people, and we're going to get sued. So maybe we should do something about it. But having that culture is important. You know, involving vendors and suppliers, and frankly, you know, even involving your consumers to help make the entire food supply safer and being honest about the product, being honest with each other, having uh, understanding that your suppliers, you know, need to make a little bit more money and that you don't necessarily squeeze the hell out of them on price just because you can. Another important, you know, thing that I tell companies is, uh, 
making relationships with public entities, whether it be a university, public health, um, consumer groups, allows you to create a culture that is more expansive when you think about food safety. These are sort of my, you know, kind of laundry list of things that I think, you know, people should pay attention to. It's amazing how many times I've taken the deposition of somebody, director of food safety, and um, how they eventually, they, they originally came out of human resources or marketing. Uh, they don't have, you know, any interest nor any background in biology. They wouldn't know a Shigella from a E. coli from a Listeria. Uh, but yet they're producing food uh, for all of us to consume. So, you know, having people, good qualified people, being proactive uh, is important. Uh, you know, making food safety a part of everything you do. And after I've depressed the group long enough, I've got one more slide for you. So we've been talking a little bit this evening about bipartisanship in Washington and how much, like, bisexuality in Iran, really very hard to come by. Uh, <laughs> but then yesterday, this happened. The Senate today passed the biggest overhaul of this nation's food safety system in decades. Huh? What? He, what? The Senate did a thing? <laughs> actual legislation about food safety, <laughs> I guess. So what legislation was so uncontroversial, it was able to unify the Hatfields and McCoys of the world's most deliberative body. Where previously the FDA could not mandate a food recall, the company had to voluntarily do it, this bill would give the FDA that power. There would be more frequent inspections of facilities. Wow, more frequent inspections, I guess like probably like twice a month instead of one, you know what I mean? <laughs> And please answer that question while I bite into this delicious hot dog. It's really quite amazing right now that a lot of FDA inspectors, they might not go uh, to a facility, but it, perhaps even once a year. <laughs> I should have known you can't make flavor like that under proper supervision. <laughs> Of course, even a bill as seemingly benign as this one does have its naysayers. The question has to be asked is why are we doing this now? It just gives the government more power over what we eat and almost literally lets bureaucrats put their hands in our food before it gets to our table. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Glenn, I think my food is already safe, but that's just how stupid you are. They know better in Washington. Yeah, man. I know my food is safe because, like all Americans, I am an expert on food safety. <laughs> but just for shits and giggles, why would there be any sort of rush to put this through now? And please answer in the form of a montage while I enjoy this savory can of SpaghettiOs. Today, more restaurants and supermarkets scramble to take tomatoes off menus and shelves. Tainted peanut products. Tainted spinach. Nationwide egg recall. A recall of alfalfa sprouts. Because of a noxious odor coming from the bag inside the box. After reports that it may be linked to salmonella. New meaning tonight to that ad phrase, uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. I see we did it because our food is killing us. <laughs> That's a good reason. But the people against the bill have some good reasons of their own. Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, you take the floor. We're going to spend $1.5 billion over the next five years on this bill because we continue to think short term instead of long term. Right. In the short term, you have explosive diarrhea. <laughs> But in the long term, hey, we're all going to die anyway, so why regulate it? <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in, preferably nonsensically? Who on the planet has a safer food supply than we do while feeding 300 million people? Well, no one does, actually. Of course, that's all thanks to the FDA, which was founded by the progressive Theodore Roosevelt. You'd probably say the same thing. Of course, you probably wouldn't say it with the same intonation.
the FDA, started by progressive Theodore Roosevelt. Right. <laughs> You'd say it like you were getting the taste of shit out of your mouth. <laughs> that damn FDA started 100 years ago just to make sure that the milk bottles you got were full of milk instead of white paint and rat <laughs> Why you got to make everything sound so sinister, Glenn? They control your food, they control you. This is about control, and in the end, starvation. <laughs> you know what? F it. It's not even worth it anymore. <laughs> but still, at least the Senate passed something. The new rules of the Senate go into effect, and they can't take that away. A food safety bill just passed by the Senate could be held up in the House because of a senatorial error. It all has to do with a constitutional provision that re requires tax provisions originate in the House. I jinxed it, didn't I? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, th that was, they're talking about the Food Safety Modernization Act, and it was interesting, um, the, uh, uh, the senatorial glitch was in the Senate version. Uh, there was a provision that if a company failed an inspection, they had to pay for a reinspection. Seems pretty reasonable. But the uh, House writers of their, their bill saw that as a tax. And so therefore, they wouldn't pass the Senate bill. It was in conference. And what was interesting is, is that all of this was happening in the last 30, 40 days in the lame duck session when the Senate was going to flip from Democrat to Republican. And at that time, if you remember, like every bill under the sun was trying to get through that lame duck session. And I was back there with a bunch of clients, and we were going from Senate office to House office to try to see if we could get them to move this bill. But at the same time, the don't ask, don't tell people were there, and the Dream Act people were there, and you know, one group or another group. And we're all vying for the same airspace of these senators who, and Congress members. And what's interesting is the Friday before, Friday before Christmas, I was, I was there and meeting with Senator Reid and uh, they were just like, oh, we can't figure out how to do this. It's not going to work. And, you know, we're I'm sorry, you know, it's not, this bill's not going to go anywhere. And, you know, with the new uh, uh, Senate going Republican, it's, this bill's dead. And I, so I go back to my hotel and uh, go to the bar and have a couple of drinks because I'm waiting to, you know, uh, go out to uh, the airport. And I go out to Dulles and people who've flown through Dulles, the, the line to get through, um, uh, security is quite long and I was standing in line and you know I'm sort of dressed like this I had a white shirt red tie blue suit on uh, you know a winter coat I'm standing in line and um, somebody grabbed my arm and they go uh, Mr. Gingrich uh, you can come this way and you know there I felt like killing myself uh, but nonetheless um, ultimately the bill passed and if if you want to get really wonky, if you go and look at the Food Safety Modernization Act bill and compare the number on the bill, the number on the bill is the same bill number as the cash for clunkers bill. Remember that? Cash for clunkers, you get money if you bring your car in, and it was kind of like to help you know, the economy move. Well, what they did is they stripped out the, the language in the bill and inserted the language from the Food Safety Modernization Act and passed it just after Christmas and the president signed it. That's how it, the Food Safety Modernization Act came into being. So um, these are a bunch of my clients from the, uh, the outbreak linked to uh, cantaloupe. Um, I think um, most of them died except the little baby. She was born uh, three and a half months premature because her mom had been eating cantaloupe to be healthy and uh, uh, listeria can cause uh, premature pregnancy and, uh, and uh, spontaneous abortions.
So um, questions? I know I kind of went a little longer than I should, but if you guys have questions, I can answer them now. Or if you guys want to hang out, uh, I'm happy. I'm here all day. I'm not going back to Seattle. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I wonder if you might want to comment. I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. On the fact that the international supply chains, the specific were about chicken, the chickens are from here, as I understand it, shipped to China, the part, they're all the parts, the chickens are cut up in China after being grown here. Right. And then shipped back here, which, you know, just boggles the mind. Just that part. But it's a, it's, what will it's it cost do effective. to, yeah, a fossil, despite the fossil fuels involved. But, right, right. But what is that going to do to the, in terms of the, le the legal aspects of if there are problems? Because And how would I know if, can I ask my local grocer if the chicken I'm buying was processed in China? You can ask, but I doubt there is any requirement for labeling because it's only where the animal, this, it's where, where the animal was raised. I know. I, I gathered yeah, that. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loophole. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, you know, the, the supply chain, to the extent that legally I can grab one of them, uh, uh, it's, is going to be liable in the U.S. I, there's nothing I can do with a, a Chinese company. I, I gave a, a lecture in Beijing once to a, a bunch of uh, Chinese business people who produce food to send to the US. And I just had to tell them, I said, you know, I can't sue you. And they were like, awesome, that's <laughs> awesome. I said, however, however, I can sue everybody you send it to in the supply chain in the US because they're responsible for buying the product from you. And when I sue them and I get a bunch of money from them, there, then now your product is, in a sense, economically more expensive, so they're going to potentially go somewhere else and you're going to lose business. So that's a bad idea, right? Oh, yes, Mr. Marler, I get that, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be, it's complex. There's, there's, there, it is going to be complex, but ultimately, if I can snag somebody locally, but that's how it's going to have to go. Yeah. Well, you know, the FDA now has a footprint in many of the countries we, um, you know, we import product from. And, and also, the Food Safety Modernization Act, in order to get passed, has much more inspection requirements for foreign products. And so, because we're not giving enough money to the FDA for more inspectors, they're draining inspectors off U.S. and, you know, doing them overseas. So. In, in many respects, potentially our food supply is going to become less safe in the U.S. than it is overseas. So, I want to say two things before unintended, uh, unintended, unintended consequences. Sorry. So, uh, two things before we continue. One is that uh, everyone in this room is invited to a uh, reception afterwards uh, in the biology department room uh, life sciences 137 most of you are all of you know where that is uh, unlike uh, other talks it's not just the grad students so everybody in the room is invited uh, second thing is um, since this is being recorded anybody that wants to ask a question I'll run over and give you the microphone so it can all be picked up okay I think there was one here you can grab this one then I'll go over here so if a product is um, USDA inspected, mm -hmm. what, and something, there's, you know, contamination um, on down the line, what responsibility does that stamp of USD inspection have? Means nothing. Okay. <laughs> That's great. It's a marketing, it's a marketing, okay. it's a marketing gimmick. It's not, it, it's, but, you know, uh, having, an ins having an inspector in a USDA facility um, and having industry stepping up post Jack in the Box and having you know, science step up with more testing has made our meat supply safer. Uh, of course, then yesterday what came out that, you know, if you eat meat, you're all gonna die. we're all going to die of cancer. So it's like, uh, anyway, I'm just going to drink bourbon. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with good Kentucky bourbon. Yes? So I have two questions. Um, the first one is a follow-up uh, to the question about international mm -hmm. food chains. How does the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership fall into that? And then um, my second question is more of a local-based question. 
regarding the bill that's currently being sponsored in the House um, with incre allowing uh, local meat producers to uh, slaughter and have their meat produced at local places that aren't inspected at the level that commercial ones are, but only can sell their stuff within states. And how, how within you think, state. Right. And how you think that that may impact the whole process. So, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a lot like most international rules. Jesus, hot back here. So sorry. <laughs> I just all of a sudden thought my hair was on fire. Um, and but it's a it's a lot like uh, it's a lot like uh, you know most international treaties and stuff. Ultimately, um, we're gonna re we're gonna require that there be equivalency, you know. And so um, there's a little bit out there that I think. Uh, I mean, there's there's other reasons to maybe not like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Food safety is not one of those things that I'm concerned about because ultimately, um, you know, the, the equivalency requirements for an FDA and FSIS are going to sort of get those fixed. Um, and, uh, and also the fact that, you know, just was I explaining about China, if they want to sell food into our marketplace, our legal system helps fix problems even if they occur overseas because we do by having a legal system that allows people to step up and be compensated and to sue for illnesses that occur you you that's the economic engine that changes behavior and makes things more expensive so i think a combination of of you know the fda food safety modernization act uh, the equivalency standards at fsis are probably going to make the Trans-Pacific Partnership not very meaningful when it comes to food safety issues. Um, the local, the, the whole thing about, you know, we could probably spend hours talking about sort of the whole local movement. Um, bacteria don't care <laughs> whether you're a mega, mega corporation or you're the local butcher. 0157 doesn't care. It'll, it's it's an equal opportunity killer. Um, I, however, I think local agriculture done well um, has less opportunities, just on a risk basis, has less opportunities to sicken bigger groups of people. Um, and it's also likely you're not going to catch it, even if you do, because you're not going to have a critical enough number of people to point back at it to say epidemiologically, yes, it was that supplier. Yes, it was that you know, uh, farmer's market. Um, but in my view is, is that food safety shouldn't be based on size. It should just be based on science and you know, whether or not you're a big producer or a small producer, you don't have to necessarily have all of the same safeguards in place, but you have to be thinking about the things that are, you know, safeguard your product. Um, I'm, so I'm less bothered by having local ag do some of the things that, um, that have become concentrated. So does that answer your question? So regarding large retail stores, a lot of them will put their store name on a product. And so large companies like Kroger, Trader right. Joe's, for example, right. I've approached them and asked questions about the supply chain. And time and time again, I get that it's proprietary information. So if these are more affordable options, how can we look forward um, to preventative measures as consumers if they're withholding information from us? So. Um, uh Store brands uh, and many brands, frankly, even non-store brands, are, used, are many times co-packed. There's a botulism. It, nobody's gotten sick from botulism, but there's a canning company in, I think it's Oregon, that's, that if you go on the FDA website uh, for recalls, it's like the last 15 things got recalled. It's all tuna, salmon, and stuff. Um, it's all... They all have different names, but they're all coming from the same packer, and they just put somebody else's label on the exterior. The, the one little wrinkle in, in, uh, for retailers 
if you put your name on a product and you look like the manufacturer, you're on the hook just like you if you were the manufacturer. So, so um, uh, the, that doesn't directly answer your question. From my perspective, I, st I could, if it's Kroger brand whatever, and it poisons somebody, I can sue Kroger directly and, and they don't have the retailer sort of immunity. Um, getting information from the retailer is gonna be up to the retailer unless there's some requirement for disclosure. And you know, I, I, I would say that if people are not willing to tell you what's in your food, it's probably not a place you want to buy your food. So. But then that gets, you know, anticipating a potential next question about, you know, what do you do about GMOs? Or what do you do about, you know, irradiating products? All of which GMOs, you know, no great science that that's a problem. And then irradiation, not a problem, except nobody wants to think about their foods being irradiated. You know, should you label there with GMO? Should you label with irradiation? And that gets very complex into, you know, people's right to know, but how much do they really need to know? I, I don't know, that's, that's a tough one. I've been in favor of giving people complete information and let people decide what the hell they wanna do. So, yes. So, one of my concerns about having more food regulations and criminal action that can take place is that that might force some food producers to use antibiotics, say, more antibiotics in their cows and in their chickens. And we, we already have 80% of our antibiotics going to these livestock, and we're seeing antibiotic resistance rates growing hugely. I mean, is there any thought or any, anything on the, the food safety pipeline anywhere that would limit the amount of antibiotics um, as a potential um, preventative means for farmers to, it's good that the food is safer, but it's I'm not sure making and, more and, dangerous and, and pathogens. I'm, 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 a, I'm not a scientist, you know, I just play one. Um, the, but I'm not sure your premise is correct. I'm not sure your premise is correct that, that, I mean, the use of antibiotics, in my experience, has nothing to do with food safety. It has everything to do with jacking animal growth and preventing illnesses in cows, not impacting the pathogens that get passed to us through their cow shit. Presumably, it does multiple things. But it's, there's still. I know but, they do it because it's right, promotion. Right, right, right. But, but they're, they're still producing. Right. They're just then. Then they're just giving us antibiotic-resistant salmonella. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so there are a lot of people that there are a lot of companies because of consumer pressures, uh, who are cutting back on antibiotic usage. I mean, you're seeing that more so. I think some big. McDonald's just, yeah. So, I mean, I think you're seeing that, but I, I, just, I just don't think that it's, I don't think the reason why, in fact, I, I, I really don't think the reason why people are using antibiotics in animals is to prevent foodborne illness, it's to prevent animals from becoming ill. And I don't necessarily think there's a, but I'll, I'll leave that up to scientists. I don't think there's that correlation, so. Yeah. 